story time. So, I used to be a ranger in Colorado, specifically about seven years ago. I loved the job, I loved being outside and enjoying nature. Respect for animals and plants are always very important to me, so I made sure the guests would follow the rules. Patrolling the trails and park maintenance was my job. I was very fit at the time, something that is very necessary for a job like this. It's not easy and can be very physically demanding. I do recommend the job to nature lovers and social butterflies. The story I'm about to share with you isn't the reason I quit to get an office job. I was forced to quit. A direct blow to my right knee in a car accident caused a very bad fracture that I never fully recovered from. Now I can't stand up for longer periods of time, so as a job, it became impossible. Now for my story. Two years before the car accident, I was working pretty late. This was during the winter, so it got dark pretty early. I was by myself and there was nobody around. I was cleaning up the trash left by the visitors and was moving debris and tree branches on the side of the trails. This had happened a few times. I really took my time making the trails as safe as possible. That night, a lot of trash was seemingly left behind. It took me longer than I anticipated and I lost track of time. I don't really mind working late. I was single and childless at the time. I just had my dogs waiting for me back at home. As I said before, there was nobody around and it was as quiet as it can get in the park. At some point, I had heard a really loud sound like something heavy was thrown onto the ground. I assumed it was a tree branch. I looked up to where I heard the noise and walked towards it, expecting to see some wood or something. When I came closer, I noticed there wasn't anything on the ground, but right after making that observation, I heard the same loud thud a bit further away from me. When I directed my eyes towards where I heard the second noise, I was surprised to see the silhouette of a person standing behind a tree. This person was very small, so small that it could have been a child. I never encountered a person by themselves that late at night. Nobody was supposed to be there. I just stood there watching for a while until I decided to ask the person what they were doing there. As soon as the first words left my mouth, this person began running. They weren't really fast and surprisingly didn't trip over anything. I began chasing the person immediately, not giving them a lecture, but to make sure they didn't get lost in the woods. That would be incredibly dangerous and could result in injury or even death in extreme cases. At some point, after a lot of running and calling out for them, they disappeared out of sight. I was surprised at how fast this person was. I considered myself to be very fit and I even used to go running frequently in high school. It seemed impossible to me, but that wasn't what I was worried about at the moment. I called my supervisor to report the incident. He told me to wait for him, and that one of my colleagues would do a search together with me. As soon as I entered the call, I heard the same thud behind me. This was the opposite direction of where we were running towards. I was certain that this person could not have walked past me without noticing. I was very confused. I turned around, saw the same silhouette behind another tree. I was pretty sure it was the same person as they were the same height and posture. Once again calling out for this, but there was no reaction. However, when I took a step towards them, they began running in a completely different direction. After I lost them once, I realized I didn't really know where I was, so I decided to find my way back. As I tried to find my way, I felt like I was walking in circles. It was confusing as I usually navigated around the park without any issues. I was lost. When I tried to call my supervisor to help find my way back, I had lost service somehow. I tried multiple times but it did not work. I began getting scared. I called out for the stranger, and once again, there was no reaction. I walked around for hours but did not get anywhere. I decided to get some rest and wait for the sun to rise. I fell asleep sitting against a tree and was woken up by a woman and her child. The walk-in trail was only a few meters from where I had slept. I was certain at the time that I wasn't close to any trail. It was so weird and unsettling. 
I don't know how to explain how I felt. For a couple of months after this happened, I had very bad nightmares about the same situation. My supervisor and colleague had been looking for both me and the stranger that night after my call but did not find either one of us. They were also a bit confused about the situation but told me that I must have been a teenager trying to play tricks, and then I was just too tired to navigate myself. I know that's not true, but don't know how to logically explain what happened that night. Maybe all of you can help me. I've never believed in God. It was all too convenient for my liking. The songs and the stories were all wrapped up in putrid desperation that made it hard to believe a word of it. Who would ever come up with such an idea as a divine being that cared equally for seven billion, not excluding those long dead and waiting to be born, of his children was doing nothing more than shouting to the void or begging for therapy. At least it sounded that way to me. What other explanation was there when children were starving or being locked in cages for daring to cross a man-made line of no crossies? How was I supposed to believe that famine and diseases were trials brought to pass by a benevolent being while people bombed and gassed and starved and enslaved? In the past, when children woke up not knowing if they'd be shot dead for pursuing an education, in the now, the pain and suffering that came with simply being alive, it did not seem like the work of a benevolent leader of any sort. Honestly, it appeared like tyranny, a child abuse even, and I personally never subscribed to it because of that. While not believing in that, also came the belief of not believing in ghosts, not believing in an afterlife of any sort, and being absolutely tickled pink by the idea of inherently nasty chronically evil beings, demons. If I could not believe in the absolute good that old women ensured me existed in a god nobody had ever seen, I wasn't sure why they thought they could convince me of the absolute evil that was supposedly too heinous to comprehend, but also no match for the goodness that was comprehensible. It did not make a lick of sense. And so, as a result, I left the church before my voice finished deepening and invested my time and effort into something that could, I feel, make a difference. I donated my time and my money, an attempt to help the helpless instead of waiting for some fabled generous deity to help them in my stead. And when I was old enough, I joined the police academy in an attempt to actually make a difference. Sure, I smoked, I drank, I indulged in women and men, but when bad things came, I was the first guy people called out to for help. I like to think that if a god does exist he's simply been playing hooky these past few hundred thousand million years. Anyway, me being too nice is pretty much how I got myself into this mess. I was working the night shift on Saturday, Randy's Saturday night shift, and just so we're clear, I was never meant to suffer this way. Because of my worsening eyesight, I was pretty much removed from the nighttime rotation in an effort to avoid having a half-blind cop having to chase some speeding dipwit down a half-lit Kentucky highway. If not for the fact that Randy's wife had suddenly gone into labor, I never had my faith shaken. You see, it was halfway through my shift, my eyes felt like they were full of sand at this point. My partner, who I'll call Vanessa, suggested we stop for a coffee calling me a hundred variations of old all the while. But before we had the chance to pull into the only open establishment within a six mile radius, McDonald's, of course, the radio began kicking up status and a report of domestic abuse. Apparently, neighbors were having a barbecue, and they had heard the woman that lived in the house to the left screaming bloody murder. When they'd gone over to check on the woman that lived there at the house, things had gone silent, and they'd been left standing at the door talking to nobody at all. We pulled into the neighborhood in record time. Leaving the car with our hands already hovering at our belts, the door easily gave beneath our combined force. When the sound ceased its echoing, I led the way into the house, a darn ear holding my breath as I tried not to make a sound of anything. I'd been to graveyards with more life and stillness, and it also made me nervous. Civilians had not reported gunshots or slamming, unless he strangled her, and there was no sign he'd killed her at all. What Wayne meant most nervous, though, was the dust that coated the counters and furniture. It was so thick I could draw it in. 
there was no evidence that anybody at all had been there in months, which meant that we'd either been set up, or the neighbors who were delusional. Vanessa and I combed the house from top to bottom, searching very carefully for signs of struggle, and when we found nothing, we headed back to the front. Our shift was nearly over at this point, and we did not have the energy to press for details. A door swinging open to my left gave me a moment's pause. We'd been so sure to close each door behind ourselves, as it was the first thing we learned in police academy, do always be hyper aware of your surroundings and alert. You never know when things may turn awry. I was quick to chalk it up to something loose in the hinges. Vanessa shuddered and went for the rosary she kept in her front breast pocket. She held it so tightly it was nearly convincing. Almost. Maybe the snorting was unnecessary. Maybe, perhaps, if I hadn't chosen to be such a pig about being an atheist, that thing wouldn't have wasted its time. But I was, so it did. A whisper that ran cold on my back seemed to lock up my ear with four words that made my entire body run cold, you're going to hell. I don't know who was faster on the way down the stairs at me or Vanessa, but at some point, I was dragging her after me and into the open air. We turned to search for the neighbors we left outside, only to find the entire street was now dark. There was no sign that anybody had ever been there at all. Vanessa took that information in, heading for the car, telling me to come up with an explanation for that. And honestly, to this day, I don't have one. I feel a little more open-minded after this event, and maybe as time goes on, I'll come to know the real truth. Perhaps my judgment of things in life is not all that accurate, given this new experience. I approached the entrance to the section of the park known for its frequent cryptid activity. Earlier that day, I received a call about strange noises and eerie sightings in the area. As the most experienced ranger in the park, I was called in to investigate. As I made my way deeper into the dense forest, I began to hear the faint sounds of rustling leaves and branches snapping in the distance. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I took out my flashlight and shone it around the trees, but I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Suddenly, I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from deeper in the forest. I ran towards the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. As I approached, I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. In front of me was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was around six feet tall, with long, spindly arms and legs, and a body covered in dark, matted fur. Its face was twisted in a snarl, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I froze, not knowing what to do. The creature let out another ear-piercing scream and began to advance towards me. I fumbled for my radio, but it was dead. I realized I was on my own. I tried to back away slowly, but the creature was too fast. It lunged at me, and I felt its sharp claws tear into my flesh. I stumbled backwards, falling to the ground. I could feel my strength leaving me as the creature began to circle me, ready to strike again. Just when I thought it was all over, I heard the sound of a shotgun blast. The creature let out a deafening roar and ran off into the woods. I looked up to see a group of rangers approaching, led by my friend and fellow ranger, Jack. Are you okay? Jack asked, rushing over to me. I nodded weakly, feeling the pain in my wounds. What was that thing? I asked, still in shock. Jack shook his head. I don't know, but we've been getting reports of strange sightings like this for months now. It's like something's out there, lurking in the shadows. I knew that this wasn't the last I would see of the creature. But for now, I was grateful to be alive, and to have friends I could count on in times of danger. As they helped me to my feet and began to make my way back to safety, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the forest held, waiting to be discovered. A Sunday night I was driving back down to my home in California. I had been visiting my hometown of Eugene, Oregon. Dark, rainy night had just passed the town of Rice Hill. Very few cars on the road. 
I was driving up a hill with my high beams on and I couldn't believe my eyes. Someone sitting in the rocks, or, on the embankment on the side of the freeway in the dark. At night, and in the rain. Initially I thought it was a person. It wasn't. It was sitting facing northward as I drove up the hill, took my foot off the gas, let the car cruise and decelerate as I continued up the hill. The thing looked at me and was seemingly aware that I was looking at it. A very frightening moment. This moment frightens me further when I realize how truly close I was to this thing. Less than 20 yards, we very definitely made eye contact. The thing was sitting in an almost fetal position with its knees up by its chin. And these long arms by its side. And then as I passed it the thing stood up and began to walk away, north along I-5. And there was no mistaking, this was not a person stranded along the freeway. The thing was tall, very tall, seven feet, more. It was very disturbing, to say the least. Have never told my family for fear of ridicule. A sighting along I-5 would be an invite for scorn. Yet, this truly happened. I don't remember the year this happened but the guy that was with me remembers this like I do. My brother's a brother-in-law his friend and I were out hunting. My brother and brother-in-law shot a deer at the beginning of a clear cut. The next morning my brother-in-law's friend and I went back to the clear cut that they got the deer in. We followed the road to just about the end of it maybe 200 to 300 yards. He stopped to the truck so we could walk around and look for morning fresh sign. On the right of the road was the clear cut to the left was a stand of timber. Before the timber right next to the road was a muddy area. Maybe four or five feet wide that followed the path of the road. He walked over to that area to look for tracks. The tracks he found were not what we were looking for. They were much bigger than man tracks but looked the same. They were not bare at least no bear I have seen. I know there is bear in the area I have seen them there. The space between the tracks and the size is what struck me. I would have to say 6 to 7 feet from print to print. When we seen the tracks the hair on the back of my neck stood up and he said he were ready to get out of there. Seeing as we both had guns I talked him to to staying a little longer to look around. We followed the tracks a short ways and they just stopped. We couldn't find any more and truth be told we didn't look very hard because the hair on our necks didn't lay back down until we were a ways out of that area. We never did go back to that area again. I did not see the guy that was with me for many years but when I did I asked him if he remembered that morning and he said he sure did. We both have told a few people about it over the years and not many people believe we saw what we saw. Before that morning I never believed that Bigfoot was real. I do now. As I was washing up in the runoff creek, I noticed my dog quickly became startled. I noticed my dog getting up and putting his nose into the wind. I saw him become scared as his hairs on his back raised. Instead of barking or growling, he quickly backtracked never losing sight of what he was tracking. When I looked in the direction he was looking, I realized why he was scared. There was a large creature coming out of the woods about 40 to 50 yards ahead, downstream and downwind from me. The creature leisurely walked out from the trees and stopped at the river bank. At first, I thought it was a person. Then I looked closer and noticed it was all in black, head to toe. I noticed its big arms covered in a thick black coat and its hands all black as well. By this time my dog was looking extremely concerned. My dog was on edge and acting erratic. Then I caught a glimpse of the creature's profile and noticed his face was all black as well, with sharp features, strong cheekbones and black lips. The creature never turned to look at me, I don't think it even noticed me or my dog. It never looked at us I realized because we were upwind from it. At that point, I wasn't sure what I was looking at though I knew I had never seen anything like it before. I instinctively ducked below the river bank and calmly and slowly moved away upstream. I signaled my dog to follow, and he instinctively understood. When I was far enough away, I raised my head up to see if I could still see it. It wasn't where I last spotted it, 
and that alerted me to leave. I made my way back to camp only a hundred feet further from the stream, and I told my girlfriend what I saw. We both were became startled since we were deep in the woods, far from the main road. We immediately packed up our camp and left the site within 10 minutes. I never thought that what I had seen was a Bigfoot. I didn't know what I had seen actually, I couldn't explain it, until we drove into Portland the next night. That night we ate at a local diner, and I picked up the local paper. One of the main stories was in regards to Bigfoot sightings. I read it thinking the topic was of interest, and realized many people had sighted Bigfoot around the area where I saw the creature. Also, all the sightings were of an all-black creature. This really caught my attention because all my life, I thought Bigfoot was brown. That is when I first realized that what I had seen might have been a Bigfoot sighting. I grew up around the country. I grew up looking for Bigfoot. My grandmother had about 100 acres or so out between Jasper, Oregon, and Lowell. She had cattle and we were driving out to look after them most every day, not just on the weekends. And I always had an eye open for something, but never once did I ever see or hear anything. And then I see something along I-5 on a rainy night. And it saw me. It knew I was staring at it. The hair on it wasn't pretty kind of uneve. All these years later I'm still a little in disbelief, but it sat like an ape with long arms and legs. And it stood up and there was no mistaking that this thing was exceedingly tall. I don't know what else I can offer. My apologies for reporting something that happened in 1997. It's funny, like I said, I grew up looking for Bigfoot or Sasquatch. More or less because of where I lived, and then I see it, or whatever I saw, and I almost wish I hadn't. Kind of shook me up. Still does a little. My friends and I were way into frisbee golf for a while. So after we graduated high school we decided to go camping down in Moab, Utah. We were lucky enough to find a really cool course a bit away from Moab. When we got there an old man said we needed to pay $10 a night. We did. Then we slept in our tent inside a yurt. That night we went to sleep with our backpacks in the tent. The morning we woke up and saw all our backpacks were outside the tent in the yurt's doorway. In my friend's camera there were pictures on his camera that showed all of us sleeping. I don't know how the old man could have done that without waking us up. I have never ever been able to sleep in a private campsite since. I was following my boyfriend to my college six hours hours away so we were in separate cars. We go on road trips often but this time we were traveling at night. We had just gone through Nacogdoches, on our way to Hawkins, Texas, so it was a two-lane paved ride with no shoulder, only tall thick trees surrounding the road. It's pretty creepy at night on its own, to be honest. There's no cell phone signal and no one lives there unless you're deep in the woods. You're pretty much messed if you get an accident late at night because someone would have to drive up on it. It was 2.30 AM and we were talking to each other on the phone. I was leading us and going around 80 miles per hour with my brights on. I go down a steep hill and suddenly an older, very tall, hillbilly looking man in a wife beater and overalls is standing in the middle of my lane and staring at me. I don't break whatsoever and scream what the f so my boyfriend will know something is about to happen and back off. I've seen way too many scary movies to end up hanging by a hook in someone's cabin shed. Got me f up. I assume he could tell that I was just going to plow him or maybe he hoped that I would swerve into the trees last minute but he suddenly moved just barely to the middle stripes so I miss him. We made eye contact when my lights hit his face and approached him and what I felt really can't be described. At that time, my boyfriend passes by and freaks the F out. We stopped driving that way and we also stopped driving long distances at night. Only two explanations here, creepy murderer or meth. I work on a fishing boat that gets contracted out by a cannery in the Alaskan Peninsula during the summer. 
The only bits of civilization out here are canneries and the only way in or out is by boat or airplane, small airplanes. About a week ago we were anchored up by a cannery for six days. We were on standby for the whole time and didn't have any orders. Normally we're decently busy and have some sort of work. During this time we all started to get really bored. We had a hard drive of movies that we powered through. To kill time we'd sleep a lot. We didn't have a skiff either so we couldn't get into town. Even if we could get to town all it had was one store that was open two hours a day and a pay phone. We were basically getting cabin fever. Anyways on the last night we were there we started to play some Madden 2013 on an Xbox. I was on a little hot streak of winning so I quit while I was ahead to go smoke a cigarette on deck. On the ocean up here you can't see many stars because during the summer it stays light out for so long, so you really notice bright lights or stars. Well I noticed this particularly bright light because it starts to move. I thought to myself it must be a plane, but then it started to move all over the place. Vertically, horizontally, in circles. I sat there thinking, no no, that's too weird. But when I was sure this thing was moving I grabbed another deckhand. I asked am I crazy or is that light moving really weird? He started to have the same reaction I had. So we both stood there in disbelief. Once I was convinced I wasn't crazy I got the other deckhands, both were playing Madden, attention. We all stood on deck hooting and hollering like apes. We were like holy shit. It's OFO. What the hell is that thing? What? It was kind of funny. But then I got this really weird sinking feeling. Since the whole North Korea thing has been heating up, it crossed my mind this could be some sort of military thing. After the light stopped moving in crazy patterns it looked like it starts to head southeast. I immediately ran inside to grab my phone, luckily we have internet on the boat, to message my family. I thought for a minute this light might be a missile headed for the west coast. I told my family I loved them, nothing to suspicious. I didn't want to scare them, and if it wasn't a missile I didn't want to sound paranoid. I knew that if a missile did hit anywhere in the US I'd have a very high chance of living because these boats are very sustainable. Besides having to fuel up there is lots of food aboard and lots of tools to fix any problems. We could go for months, maybe years on our own. After a minute the light stopped moving. The other deckhands kept saying it was moving but I wasn't seeing it. I realized we all must have been staring at the TV for too long and our eyes were probably just adjusting to the outside. We all laughed it off. I didn't tell anybody I thought it was a missile because that thought sort of shook me up a little. So out where I live it's just outside of a town nestled at the bottom of mountains. For your information I live in Australia, and it's not too secluded. Since I live with my family and you'll generally come across someone's property every 500 meters. But there are some stretches where you won't see a house for a km. One night my mom and I are coming home pretty late at night and we were just talking and listening to the radio. We come around a corner and we both saw this creature that I still don't know what it is till this day. But it had the body the size of a medium dog, mangy looking black fur, an almost abnormally large head, big green eyes, which was the first thing I noticed. But most weirdly an almost impossibly long and thin neck, like it shouldn't be able to support the large head. My mother and I are cussing like sailors at this point and make a U-turn around to get a better look at it, and within 10 seconds there was no trace of it. Normally I'd brush this off as probably a wild dog but the body just didn't look like a dig and it was too big for a cat, even a wild one. The real scary part is that my family and I have seen that maybe two to three times now almost exclusively late at night. However my so's father has said that he's also seen it twice, once at night and once at daytime and I get the feeling we're not the only people in town to have seen it. Backpacking alone in the woods of Missouri. I was woken in the middle of the night by a blood-curdling scream in the dark. This was miles and miles from any town or houses. I thought it must have been a bird or something, and settled back down to sleep. 
Before I could drift off again, I heard another scream, only this time closer. Definitely not a bird, not a bug or anything I could think of that would habitat those woods. It repeated again and again, coming ever closer, until it sounded like it was right outside of my tent. I was too terrified to look outside, too terrified to move. All of the sudden it stopped. I spent the rest of the night terrified and alone, completely bewildered by the screams. Once I got back to civilization, I found out it had been a red fox making the cries in the night. They make a crazy howl slash scream that sounds totally unreal. I had never heard the noise they make, so you can imagine how scared it made me that night. I'd drive from Denver to Sioux Falls, South Dakota back in my college days. One night somewhere just north of Valentine, Nebraska. I seen this craft type triangle thing 30 feet on each side, with lights on each tip. I slowed down to 20 on the highway and stared at it. It was 50-ish feet from the road but up in the air 200 feet. It made almost no noise except for a low hum. Then it took off. Strangest thing I've ever seen and can't explain. A couple of friends and I were camping around Camp Verde, Arizona years ago, Clear Creek I think. Of course we decided to eat a bunch of shrooms the first night, because why not, the stars were amazing. So we are all stumbling around about midnight or so along the edge of the creek having a great time not very far from our site, and I ran back to grab my camera. For some reason I decided to shine my light across the creek, and sitting right there was a big ass cougar, reflective cat eyes and all. I didn't think much of it, knew it probably wasn't going to bother us and continued on to grab my camera. I get back and all I hear is screaming, like little girl screaming, and here comes my friend running and tripping every few feet screaming his ass off and just start packing all his shit. Took about 10 minutes for him to even be calm enough to tell me what the F happened. He saw the big cat across the creek. I proceed to laugh for the next 20 minutes or so, I was crying, peeking on those magical things about then. My pop, mum's dad, owned a 900 or so hectare property in some mountains near to my hometown really cool place filled with creeks, streams and a lot of 4x4 tracks. He recently sold it, but we used to go up there pretty frequently and stayed in a hut. Anyway, one day while staying there we took a trip to just outside of his property to the remains of this old house. It was completely abandoned, parts of the floor had caved in and I think bits of the roof were missing. What was weird though was that their cupboards were still full of food. There was a bottle of wine on the table and some beans I think on a bench. He explained that the father of the family was crushed by a tree in some sort of logging accident and they moved out about 40 years ago. It was just so weird that they left all their food there. 2. Similar to the fire watcher seeing the light, I once saw something similar while camping. There was this light that just hovered in the air for hours sometimes moving up or down or side to side but never really going anywhere until it disappeared. I googled it frantically when I got home and apparently flares from planes can hover like that in the wind? I don't understand how and it was extremely creepy. Bonus weird thing, another place very close to the outside of my pop's property was an abandoned school that had been ran by a commune of hippies that lived nearby. Huh. Schools aren't weird, I hear you say. Well they are when they're built at the end of an open field with no roads anywhere nearby, not even dirt. Just a random school with a steel fence around it. Had about two or three classrooms I think from memory. One day I want to go back there, but it is private property and I doubt I'd find it again with how huge the area is. Late 70s my dad and his buddies went trekking out in northern Siberia in late fall. Being several days from the nearest village the likeliness of encountering other humans was extremely unlikely. Having set camp for the night, about a week into their journey, the party started a campfire. About halfway through the night, 
The guy watching noticed two figures approaching the camp from the woods. It was two guys, wearing prison fatigues, thing was nearest gulag type facility was at least 200 kilometers away. My dad's buddy pulled a rifle on them and asked them to stop. They asked if they could warm themselves by the fire so dad's friend woke everyone up. They stayed for around a half hour and dad and co fed them some food. The two guys started getting anxious and after about an hour decided it was time to leave. They left into the dark forest and my dad did never hear about them again. In the morning they tried to follow their tracks, but the heavy snowfall had made search impossible. Growing up, I lived in a fairly secluded area, only four or five other houses on a five mile road. My brother, a few friends, and I played in the woods a lot during summer breaks from school. One summer we spent countless hours building a house in the woods out of sticks and rocks. Truthfully, it was a decent house, we got stuck in a heavy rainstorm and were able to take shelter in it and only got mildly damp. School started up again so we stopped playing in our house, but one day just after the first snowfall my brother and I decided to go back to our house and see if it was still standing. When we got close I noticed that a few things had been moved but just assumed it was animals or wind or something. When we got right up to it and were able to see inside it was clear that something or someone had been inside, possibly for a decent amount of time. We do have bears and other wildlife around, but this was clearly something with the ability to design a living space. A space was cleared to sleep with leaves for padding and there was a makeshift table made out of a large flat rock that had been carried there, we looked at each other and headed back home quickly, maybe half a mile or better. We never talked about it after that and we didn't mention it to our parents, but I never went back there and always took someone with me if I went into the woods after that. Apparently, when I was younger, like barely able to speak, I was sitting on the floor playing with some toys nonchalantly with my mom when I just said when I was in heaven, I met a woman who said you'd be the perfect mommy for me. I apparently held the belief that I was in heaven before being born, and an angel looked at me and chose the mom I went to. My mom asked me to describe the woman, and I apparently described my mom's great-grandmother perfectly. Down to the eye color. I had never met my great-great-grandmother, nor seen a picture of her. As a child visiting my grandma's house, my mum's, mum, whenever I left the house I'd wave next door to Ken who was always sat in the bay window looking out at the sea. They lived right on the coast off the North Sea in Hartlepool, UK, we'd never really talk, but just a little wave before I went to get into the car. One time I'm leaving my grand's house, I'm in front of my mum who stopped at the door to talk to my gran. So I head down the steps and towards the gate. I turn back and see Ken in the window. Big smile as usual, waving at me. I give him a wave back. He stands up, gives me the thumbs up, and wanders towards the back of the room. My mum comes walking down the steps and asks who are you waving at? I replied Ken. To this day, I can remember my mom's face. She just went white, but didn't say anything to me. It was only a few weeks later when she plucked up the courage to tell me, that Ken had died a few days prior to our visit to my grands. I don't believe in ghosts, but I know I saw him. I can still picture his striped grey sweater with light stripes across it. Him waving and getting up out of his chair. There was no one else in the house, he lived by himself. Brains are weird. Update 1. Sorry for the delay in getting back. But I had an update from my mum regarding me seeing Ken. I reminded her of the incident, and what she can remember of it. I got this reply. I'm sure you saw him too, I know there's someone in our house. Ashley, mum's cat, sees them on the stairs the same time every night if we are in the lounge. I always say hello. Definitely doesn't feel like a threatening presence though. So now it turns out there's not just Ken next door. There's someone in my mam's house. Maybe it's my gran. 
Once pandemic is over I'll have to stay over a few nights to see for myself. This wasn't total seclusion, but when I was a kid, I was a boy scout, and one of the merit badges, wilderness survival, required that you spend one night with one other person in a shelter you built. Me and another scout hiked out around 10 miles from the base camp, and me and the other scout went off another mile, and set up our shelter. Later in the day, the counselor came and checked on us, to make sure our shelter was done and to drop off some food for us. He left, and me and the scout crawled into our shelter to sleep. That entire night was incredibly messed. Me and the scout had incredibly surreal dreams, and would often be drifting in and out of sleep. At one point, I woke up and looked out of the shelter, and I swear on my life, I saw some black figure outside of it staring right back at me. Even later, I went out to pee, and everything outside was completely silent, and it felt as if I was being watched. Me and the scout ended up leaving the shelter around 5 in the morning to get back o the camp, and we never told anyone outside of fellow scouts about it. So back like 8 years ago or so I was around the age of 8. Me and my family were on our way back from a family fishing trip in the spring time. For reference we live in Canada and the place we drove to was about 2 hours away from any kind of civilization. So we're driving down the road when we see this hooded figure walking along in the field. As we drive by we notice he was wearing the grim reaper hood and he had the seeth, but you couldn't see his face. As we passed he stopped and stared at us. Needless to say we got heck out of there in a hurry. Once, my mom and I were driving to Las Vegas from Santa Clarita. We were just passing Barstow and on the I-15. It was right about high noon and very hot. Not a cloud in the sky. She had a fancy Lexus at the time with a touchscreen console on the dash that could play DVDs while driving. I remember we were on a long stretch of road with a lot of space between cars on the highway. One minute we see nothing ahead of us and then all of a sudden, a woman was walking across the highway right in front of our vehicle. My mom swerved behind her and barely missed her. She pulled off to the shoulder and we looked behind us and we see her go all the way across the highway, including westbound traffic. Then she turned around, and walked all the way across again. Each time, nearly getting clipped by an unsuspecting and oncoming car like ourselves. At one point, a semi-truck almost hit her head on missing her by literally one step. Each step she took was a steady and confident step, looking ahead of her and never batting an eye to any oncoming traffic. She was barefoot mind you and walking on the boiling asphalt with zero sense of urgency. So my mom calls 911, we're directed to highway patrol. They say they've received numerous reports and they're headed out to it. My mom decided after hanging up to slowly reverse down the shoulder to get a better look and see if she's okay, yes, I know, stupid in more than one way. As we get to a spot behind her now, She's crossed the highway and is now in front of our vehicle. This part I will never forget. The woman slowly turns her head and looks at us and is now slowly but steadily walking towards our car. She was white as day in every way. White nightgown, pale, dry, wrinkled skin, white hair, and the palest bluish-gray eyes I've ever seen and barefoot. Almost looked like a walking dead version of Rose Dawson from Titanic. I was in the passenger seat, which was on the shoulder. When my mom made eye contact, she froze. Absolutely shut down. I remember the woman walking so close to my door, I could see her eyes make contact with mine. It looked as if she was blind and lifeless but could not just see me, but see into and through me like into my soul. I went cold immediately. She reached for my door handle and I remember screaming at my mom to punch the gas and without hesitation, she came to quick and we peeled out of there. In the back window, I saw her watch us speed off and then continue to cross the road again. A mile down the highway, 
We called Highway Patrol to see what happened and they didn't have a clue what we were talking about and said they got no reports of a woman crossing the highway. My mom to this day still doesn't remember the time between when we reversed to when we dipped out. I have no idea what happened that day except for what I witnessed and experienced. I grew up in a pretty boring town that does not have much stuff you can do as a teenager besides skating, drinking and trying to get laid. So, to accomplish the last part I invited my someone and another couple to a place I only know from when I was riding the train. To clarify, it was slash as a small man-made rural forest sea, about two big swimming pools big, with natural water in it. It lies near train tracks but the train rode only once a day and there weren't any roads so you can't easily drive up there. So my plan was to create a romantic atmosphere with my significant other and so I brought wine, a small cassette player, yep, I'm old, some food and a small tent. The extra couple were friends of us, so I thought that might help. Part 1 as I've never been there before and like I said there weren't any roads we had to walk about 8 miles along the rail tracks to get there. About halfway we noticed that there was not a single house slash farm slash industry related compound at all and we did not see cars or other people. That was one thing I've never noticed before when I was riding the train, because why would you? We did not think about any dangers or about cell phone reception since cell phones were a thing only adults had back then. The sky was clear and bright that night when we arrived and we already had some wine in us so we did not bother to set up our tents, left all our stuff, food, drinks, tents, clothes, behind a tree and went right in the water. We must have been in there for about an hour before we started getting cold. So we all got out simultaneously and went straight for our stuff. But it all was gone. At first we thought we must have made a mistake and put the stuff elsewhere and started looking around but after half an hour we gave up and were scared as hell. I totally sobered up in minutes and we started getting really cold because although it was summer we were wet and summers in my country aren't that hot, especially not at night. I decided that we find us a spot where we could overlook all of the area and sit around back to back in a circle and stay there until the sun rises. So we did. It was really cold, we were all half naked and it was quiet and windy and every time something moved, like trees from the wind, or a noise was made we all got a huge scare out of it. We did not talk for hours and when the sun was high enough so there were no invisible corners or bushes left, we quickly went back. Barefoot, half naked, dehydrated, tired and still scared. It took us way longer back than last night because every half mile we had to stop because of exhaustion or because something felt not right. My house was the closest so we went straight there, drink, ate, showered and that was it for a while. Part 2, two months later to the day, I remember because it was my birthday, I had some friends over for some hanging around and getting drunk. The couple was with us, my significant other not, because she moved away shortly after that. I was fall now, so the days were getting shorter and when it started to become dark we lit up a small fire in my parents' backyard and just sat there talking and drinking. Suddenly I hear our dog bark which was odd, because she was always a very quiet fellow so I went to check it out and catched a glimpse of a person at our front door running away. It was too dark and he or she was too quick so I could not make out a face or gender. I stood there for a few moments and he opened the door but nobody was there. When I looked down I saw a really big bag so my self-concentrated younger me thought, cool, presence. I opened up the bag only to find the clothes and the sleeping bag from our adventure two months ago in there. And a freaking note that said, happy birthday my name. I was scared to death and still am very anxious because I cannot be a prank, because we told nobody we were going to do this trip, there is not a house or anything near that place and we did not see a single soul for 24 hours. I've never told the couple or my significant other of this because let's be real here, there is no use in scaring them again after what we went through. Over 20 years have passed since then and nothing has ever happened there or to me or my friends.
In my physics gen ed last year, we were split up in groups and working on a lab. A guy at another table let out a yell while extending his arms, and fell headfirst off his chair. The very second in between his yell and hitting the floor, a beeping started going off in the room, followed by the words an emergency is happening in your building. Please evacuate at the nearest exit. And accompanied by flashing lights. The guy is having a seizure on the floor, so all we're focusing on is getting him help. A campus police officer comes in and tells us the rest of the science buildings have already evacuated for the fire alarm. Most of us leave to give some space to the people helping the guy. While outside, we're talking amongst ourselves, absolutely baffled by the coinciding events we just witnessed. Did the flashing of the alarm trigger epilepsy? No, because he was already on the floor by the time the lights kicked in. Was there some kind of sensor on him that alerted when his body was experiencing an emergency? No, because it was his first seizure. Just reading it might sound lame, but witnessing it and working out what was happening in real time was just eerie. A few years ago my boyfriend at the time and I were driving home from visiting friends. It was about 3 am and we were taking a long, winding road down from the eastern suburbs to his house. This road has a pretty good view over the city and surrounding suburbs and out to the sea. There was one car on the road further in front of us and as we came into the first bend, a huge round orange light appeared above the horizon. The light was easily three times as big as the outlines of construction cranes on the shoreline and as we continued down into the next bend, the light turned into a wavy line across the horizon and then disappeared completely. This happened within about 10 seconds and we checked to see if there were any reports of anyone seeing the same thing. There was nothing. My boyfriend and I were completely sober and both saw the exact same thing but could never find an explanation for what it was or how no one else in the city seemed to see it. To this day, I regret not following the other car to ask if they had seen it too. I was an Uber driver in San Francisco. I spent on average 10 hours in the driver's seat in a day's effort I would make anywhere from $200-$300. I now moved to a different city. I was just starting my journey with the company. First day on the job I'm super pumped to be talking to people that hailed me on the internet only to get in my car. Story goes I was on my second trip for the ride sharing company. Due to circumstances I cannot experience explain other than my lack of experience I received a request at a swank hotel the Ritz Carlton. After accepting the trip request I glanced at my phone to see the time it read 20 minutes past 10 pm. I waited for what seemed as the longest 5 minutes on God's green earth. After deciding to leave 3 dishy Indian interns knock on my window and I let them in. The trip was amazing nobody was talking and one guy fell asleep. The trip was a long distance, 19 miles, and it was surging by 2.6 so I was about to get paid major green. Move comes to shove that wasn't the only green that I was witnessing and I see a guy in the back seat start to whimper. He had awakened from his sleep and started pulsing all over the back seat of my car without opening the windows. Sickened from the odor I continued to drop them off at their hotel. Needles to say I was green to my stomach with the grime and stench I had to clean up. Many rideshare drivers love what they do for their communities in support of establishing an equal price for transportation as well as driving drunk people home safely. Please don't puke in their cars. In 1996, I had just dropped out of university and was moving home to my parents' place. My tail was firmly between my legs, I had almost no money and no job prospects. Basically I was screwed. I had an old Jeep Comanche with all my belongings in the back and 200 miles to go. I borrowed $20 from a friend for gas and started the trip. I got to a point that was 30 miles from home and was on empty. I pulled into a gas station slash rest stop and sort of cried for a minute in my truck. I needed $5 for gas to make it the rest of the way and had nothing. There was no way I could call my dad and ask for help. 
He was already so disappointed. After a minute I started searching around my truck for change. Anything. I opened the glove box and there were these paper loyalty bucks for a gas station that I never used. It turns out it was the exact gas station that I was stopped at. Four dollars worth of bucks. I found another two dollars in change, put six dollars in the gas tank and bought a coke. I made it home. Fast forward 20 years, I had sorted my crap out and I'm a lawyer. That gas station hired me as their outside counsel. I got to tell this story to the president of the company. I'm a firefighter and we got a call for an overdose around 3 a.m. to a rough part of our district in the middle of winter. Unfortunately the patient was long gone and her dealer or whatever found her like that when he dropped some stuff. As we were packing up our stuff mind you this is absolutely trashed mobile home, I hear something down the hall that said lights? I ask my partner if he said anything as it was just him and I cleaning up he said no. I walk to the far end of the trailer where I heard it and shine my flashlight I get a reflection out of the window. They have a small tool shed and it had a flickering light, it piqued my interest so my partner and I go out there. We hear crying and notice the door is padlocked. We cut it, and this little six-year-old girl was in there. She said her mom puts her in there when she gets mad at her. She said she got scared when she heard the sirens and didn't know what to do. To this day I have no idea what happened or where the voice came from, but I'll take the win on it. Edit, a couple people wondering about what happened after, my partner and I took her to the children's hospital closest to us and we wrote our report and ate chips and a sandwich we took from the lounge while they called a social worker. She was a really sweet girl, the voice was not a little girl voice I 100% thought it was my partner since it sounded like a guy. at friend's house. Friend was in garage working on dirt bike. Driveway empty because parents left a while ago. Go inside to grab a soda but decide to look for his cat. Who I haven't seen all day. I walk into the office and as I'm calling her name, a deep man's voice goes meow right into my right ear. I jump and run around the main floor looking for who said that. Didn't find anyone. About five years ago I was out with two friends. At the time, this group of friends liked to party hard, as did I. We were a few years out of college living in a resort town. That night, we went out to dinner and then went to a bar. We all did a round of shots when we got to the bar. Immediately after the shot, I felt like I needed to throw up. It was odd because I had not drank much at dinner and I was very accustomed to taking shots. This was a very bizarre reaction for me. I had been driven there by one of the friends but I immediately decided I needed to leave, so I got a cab, went home, and felt completely fine when I got home. I would usually have been out until 4 am, but I was home by 11 pm. I watched TV and went to bed but the whole night, I had a weird feeling. I woke up the next morning and the two girls I was with had been in a car accident. The person driving was drunk and texting, and she hit a huge telephone pole. The pole fell onto the car, almost splitting the car in half. By the grace of God, the universe, something. Neither of them were harmed, but if someone was sitting in the back seat, they would have potentially been dead. I am 100% certain I would have gotten into that car and likely would have been sitting in that seat. I don't F with drinking and driving or anyone who attempts to drink and drive anymore. I have a story to tell which could provide one possible explanation to what happened. Few years ago, one of my friend went off to a college in California. She spent a few quarters in the student dorms there and felt it was really expensive. So she found herself a place, a townhouse I think which had a separate entrance to her living space, a little distance away, and would commute every day to and from her classes and she'd stay gone for most part of the day. In the first week she started to notice some signs, her clothes on the floor in the morning when she would clearly remember she'd left them on a chair, water spilled on the floor in her living room, 
shower which never seemed to dry completely and little things missing here and there. I remember we used to joke about how she was getting old and forgetful during our calls. This one day however she comes home to a broken cup which she swore was a new one and she never used it. Later that day, when she was talking about it on a group call, most of us were saying she is being paranoid and a broken cup was not sign enough that her house is haunted, which at that point she was certain about. This one guy did recommend her to record the house while she was gone. She took his advice, did a bit of research and decided to buy a ring, or some equivalent of it back then, for her front door and some cheap motion sensor camera for her kitchen and living room. The ring got delivered first and she set it up immediately while the rest of her stuff was due to be delivered the next day. Next morning, she goes about her day like she always would, gets back home and checks to see what the ring captured. To her horror, she sees a two events, one capture of a guy leaving the house and the other, the same guy getting back into the house. The second one was just a few minutes before her viewing. She freaks out as one would expect and yeets out of there, calls the police who come in and arrest this guy, who was basically co-living with my friend, in her apartment. Apparently there was an attic door of some sort which my friend never opened and that had a roof access which he made his home. He would basically wait for my friend to leave, to take a shower, pour himself some coffee, help himself to something from the refrigerator, get out if he needs to and make sure he comes back in before my friend gets back which used to be pretty late in the evening. This incident scarred her and she chose to move back to the dorm soon after. When she was packing to leave, she found a pillow and some blankets in the walk-in closet in her bedroom which she never saw when she moved in. That freaked her out even more, because she believes that dude must have spent several nights in the closet while she slept on the bed and she never knew. When I was younger, in elementary school, I used to have the same dream every weekend starting on Saturday, when I would go to sleep, and then waking up in the middle of the night, on Sunday, and throwing up. The dream was always a bunch of numbers. Not even anything happening just a bunch of random jumbled up numbers all over the place. I never understood why that happened where the same dream would happen on the same night every week and I would throw up every single time. I always think about it and wonder what it was or if it was just some weird coincidence. Also I would not have any signs of being sick before or after. Maybe someone else has experienced this? My girlfriend got out of the shower and called me into the bathroom to show me the mirror. There was a very strange, distinct handprint placed on the mirror. I lived alone and she was the only adult that had been to my house in about two years. We each placed our handprints on the sides of the mystery handprint for reference and neither look anything like the mystery print. I still have no idea how it got there. Edit. To address a couple of ideas, I've lived in this house for over a decade. The mirror isn't newly installed. The mirror is cleaned pretty regularly. I've taken many showers and fogged up the mirror and have never seen it. Edit 2. Not the person I bought the house from but the previous owner, she died in this house. I was watching my neighbor's 5 year old kid a few years prior to this and she was eating at the kitchen table. She asked me who was that lady that just went upstairs? There was no lady or any other person in the house. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.